called The Gospel. And right now we're in part two of our series. Um, and uh, it's also like part two of a, uh, of a sermon. Uh, last week, we looked at what is the gospel part one. And today we're going to be looking at what is the gospel part two. Uh, many of you would know that I am on a couple of different platforms of social media. I restrict myself to Facebook and Instagram. However, I'm a very reluctant person to post anything on uh, any forms of social media. I've seen many people uh, share things on social media that they shouldn't be sharing on social media. And for some people, um, uh, many don't seem to realise the fact that once something is out there, it's out there permanently for the entire world to see. Uh, People can take things the wrong way or misread certain things. And this has happened to me in the past and so I've just thought it best to stay mostly away from all the stress of that and not bother posting anything myself. I don't want to invite any unnecessary drama into my life. Now that's true for me except for one specific time every single year where I am willing to share about a certain event and that event of course is the state of origin. More specifically, I am more than willing to share with uh, everyone that I know that if the Blues win, that I am rejoicing in, uh, in that fact. <coughs> Once a year, if the Blues win the state of origin, I am going to be sharing that everywhere because I am a loyal Blues supporter. But on the contrary, if the Maroons win the state of origin, I will usually have some of my friends, in inverted commas, send me some less than kind, less than Christian messages to let me know that the Blues have not won. Sport is one of those things for some guys that makes them have to share everything they know, whether it's the Australian Open, the cricket, AFL, NRL, basketball, or something else. For some guys, there can be this passion that stirs in them when it comes to some sport that makes them have the need to share it with people. Um, this word, this term gospel comes from this word euangelion, which means good announcement or good news <coughs> and it has this kind of idea that it is such a good announcement and should fill the sharers of this announcement with such passion and joy that they have to share it in the P- uh, with the people that they come into contact with And as we continue to explore what the gospel is today, remember that we're not simply looking at this from a theoretical or intellectual perspective. Rather, we're looking at this because this is genuinely good news that we desire to share with people that we come into contact with in our lives. Last week, we began looking at the gospel according to Jesus, which is simply this. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The gospel that Jesus preached was the gospel of the kingdom and everything that this entailed. But what we'll see today is that the gospel that Jesus preached was simply a foundational or launching platform for other versions of the gospel to be shared. Jesus shared the gospel of the kingdom of God because the primary audience that he was sharing with were Jewish people from a small small area primarily around Galilee, later on in Jerusalem, and these people were uh, severely suffering under the Roman occupation. And so the message of the kingdom promised that there was a better kingdom reality than the kingdom that the people were currently living under, and so this message connected with the people that Jesus shared with in a really powerful way. But what you begin to see throughout the New Testament, as the church begins to expand and grow, is that the way the gospel is presented, it changes dependent on the audience that someone comes into contact with. And you begin to see this fairly clearly, fairly early on throughout the New Testament. It's very clear that the gospel message is contextualized according to the audience who is receiving it. And yet there are some consistent patterns 
and themes which we can draw out in being able to present a clear gospel presentation. One of the clearest places that we see that Paul is explicit about the fact that the gospel message needs to be contextualized comes in 1 Corinthians 9 verses 9 to 23. And it says this, it'll be up there on the screen. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. So here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul is essentially that he will saying that he will do whatever is necessary, short of sin, of course, to present the gospel in whatever form is necessary to be able to win people to Jesus. He will become one person to one group, another person to another group, and he will do all of this to ensure that the people that he, uh, the, that he becomes like are able to hear the news of Jesus in a way that is helpful and applicable to them. <coughs> Better uh, said, he will contextualize the gospel for them, meaning he will bring the gospel and present the gospel into the context that the people find themselves in. But this also doesn't mean that anything goes. The gospel is not just any message. To know what the gospel is, this can't just be some nebulous idea that we're not able to articulate. There has to be a certain level of clarity around what the gospel is, while still being able to do what the disciples do, and being able to contextualize the gospel to different groups that we come into contact with. Throughout the New Testament, Paul himself offers uh, several different presentations of the gospel, but one of his most explicit presentations comes in 1 Corinthians 15, and part of 1 Corinthians 15 says this, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Now, following this passage, after what I've just read, the first five verses in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul speaks about how Jesus continued to appear to people after he had uh, been raised to life. It seems like Paul is uh, trying to reinforce the idea to his readers that the gospel is actually true good news through the way that he is arguing a case for Jesus' resurrection. Now, following uh, this, following his case that he begins to build, uh, G uh, Paul speaks about the result of the resurrection of Jesus for those who believe in Jesus, which is that if we have placed our trust in him, then we will be raised to new life when Jesus returns. Now, understand that Paul is not trying to, in this moment, give a holistic presentation of the gospel here. Rather, he seems to be pointing the, uh, the Corinthians back to a time where he did present the gospel to them and is speaking to certain elements of that because he says, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you. And in particular, there is one element of the gospel which is the center and the focal point of the entire 
good news message. It's the point that everything else hangs on, which is what Paul is driving home here, which is the death and the resurrection of Jesus. The death and resurrection of Jesus is the thing that in our entire faith is built on and is the reason that we have any good news available to us at all. If Jesus didn't rise again, nothing about our faith has any meaning or purposes. Purpose. Everything hangs on this one point, that Jesus died and that he rose again. <clears throat> the rest of 1 Corinthians 15 is Paul articulating an argument, saying why everything hangs from this point. He goes so far as to say later on, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. This is so important because although it might sound elementary to some of you that Jesus died and rose again for us, you can't share the good news of Jesus without sharing the most central point which everything else hangs on. Several years ago, I was part of a youth outreach that was an evangelistic effort to uh, reach our high schoolers in our area. This youth outreach was an initiative from a national organisation, and this organisation uh, went into schools uh, the week leading up to the outreach and invited young people to, uh, to come along to this. <laughs> the work they did in the schools was great. There was a rap artist who... Uh, who performed during lunch times, and it finished with an invitation uh, for the high schoolers to come along to, uh, to this outreach. Hundreds of, uh, of young people would come along to this outreach that we held, uh, and all of the youth groups of the area would combine on this night to see a great night happen together. And on this occasion, there had been some great music and games at the top of the outreach service. The rapper who had gone into the schools did a short set, and then it was time for the message. Now, this is the moment of all moments when you are doing a youth outreach to high schoolers where the gospel needs to be presented very, very clearly and powerfully. The rapper, who it turns out uh, for some reason was also the speaker, he hopped up and for 10 to 15 minutes, he told the young people about how every single one of them are diamonds. God sees them as a diamond and they are precious to him. Now, that's actually a great message. There's nothing wrong with anything that he had to share. But the whole time I was sitting there, these 10 to 15 minutes, and wanting him to say a little bit more than that. I was waiting for him to speak into the death and the resurrection of Jesus and why it was necessary for us. I was sitting there wanting him to take the next step to tell people that the good news of Jesus is even more than just what he had said. Yes, he could, was able to say that we are diamonds made in the image of God, we are valuable and we are God's possession, but there is more to the gospel than just that message that he was sharing. But that's all he said for about 15 minutes in multiple different ways without mentioning the, uh, the name of Jesus. <coughs> At an outreach night in particular, that is not what should have been done. I was expecting and hoping and praying for the gospel to be presented very, very clearly during that night. And at the end of his message, he asked everyone to come forward if they wanted to know what it was to understand that God sees them as a diamond. Well, kids began to rush forward. They were feeling great about understanding this message. And immediately following this, anyone who responded, which was probably between 70 to 80 kids, they were taken into the second auditorium and <coughs> um, uh, where they would be told briefly about the decision that they had made and would be given some next steps in, uh, in what to do in a faith journey. And whose job was it to tell the kids about the decision that they had made? It was my job. And in my overzealous young adulthood, I tried to fill all the gaps 
that I thought the speaker had left out. I gave the most passionate five-minute presentation of the gospel that I was possibly able to, speaking about the fact that although we were created diamonds and that God loves us, we have turned away from his love through sin, but Jesus lived the life we can't live and died on the cross and rose again for every single one of us so that if we have faith in Jesus, we can have eternal life. I was very zealous as I was presenting this to these, uh, to these young people. And about half of the kids looked at me really confused. I was probably a bit too overzealous, but I really did want these young people, thank you, Craig, to understand the good news of Jesus. In a follow-up meeting, we spoke about how everything had gone, and one youth pastor from another church said that one of their youth kids left feeling a bit confused after being in the talk that I gave. They said, I just went into that room because I wanted to be a diamond. Now, there was nothing wrong with what the rapper slash speaker said, but he left out the most foundational and central theme of the gospel, which is the death and the resurrection of Jesus. It's paramount that we keep the death and the resurrection of Jesus central to any good news that we are sharing about Jesus. Now, we might think that this is true of this guy, but we would never do that. But the thing I see more Christians struggle with when it comes to sharing the gospel than anything else is that we can often forget to uh, to keep the main thing the main thing. Meaning we can get lost in all of these arguments about secondary issues or even less important issues without keeping the central truth at the forefront. And the central truth is the death and resurrection of Jesus. We can have arguments about creationism versus evolution about whether the flood really happened, about the nature of eternity and what it looks like, about what morality is required for a Christian, about what perspectives on controversial issues a Christian should take. And yet the gospel of Jesus isn't about any of that. It's centered around the death and the resurrection of Jesus. The goal of the Christian is to help people believe that Jesus really did rise again from the dead. The reason that Paul gives all of this detail in listing the, uh, the names of the people who saw Jesus raised from the dead is to give evidence about this fact and help people to believe that Jesus really did rise from the dead. If Jesus didn't rise from the, te- from the dead, then nothing changes. But if Jesus did rise from the dead, then everything changes. It means that what Jesus said was true. It gives eternal weight and infinite power to the rest of the good news of Jesus Christ. Central to the good news is the death and resurrection of Jesus. And we have to keep that as the center. (coughs) Because those in the early church were convinced of the resurrection of Jesus, they were then able to believe in the rest of the gospel. Now, we've looked at the gospel uh, Jesus presents, the kingdom, and the gospel that Paul presents, and what's central to his uh, gospel um, presentation, which is the death and resurrection of Jesus. But there was a certain gospel message that those in the early church would have widely known as the gospel which is simply this, the gospel according to Matthew, the gospel according to Mark, the gospel according to Luke, and the gospel according to John. These four different gospel accounts from four different authors are exactly what they're called. They are gospel accounts. They tell the good news of Jesus and are centered on his life, death, and resurrection and include his teaching on the kingdom. 
These would have been acknowledged and circulated fairly early on by the church and were considered the good announcement of Jesus. Now, if you remember from last week, a Roman witness would often hop up in the middle of a town square. They would share their good announcement of the military uh, victories of Caesar uh, over neighboring countries. They would often do this, and this was called a euangelion or a good announcement. But it's highly likely that these gospel accounts were uh, given in the same way. A witness of Jesus, meaning a Christian, would likely have hopped up in the town or in the synagogue, opened up a scroll with one of these gospel accounts, and would have begun to share the good news of Jesus. Now, the reason that these gospel accounts are included in the Bible was due to high levels of scrutiny from the early church fathers. There were four requirements to have a book uh, to be included as uh, as canon in the New Testament. Number one, was the author an apostle or have a close connection with uh, with an apostle? Number two, was the book being accepted by the body of Christ at large? Three, did the book contain consistency of doctrine and orthodox teaching? And number four, did the book bear evidence of high moral and spiritual values that would reflect a work of the Holy Spirit? Now, all four of these gospel accounts fulfill this different criteria, which is why they are part of our New Testament. They were already being circulated widely by the early church as the gospel. And it's why other writings, like the Gospel of Thomas, which was not written by the disciple Thomas, is not included as part of our canon of Scripture. (coughs) All of these are gospel accounts. They were written for different uh, purposes to different audiences. Some were written to Jews, some were written to Gentiles, some sought to convince people of Jesus' deity, some tried to create a historical account of his life. All of these different gospel accounts are presenting the good news of Jesus in very different ways because the people that they are writing to are very different audiences. A very clear example of the way uh, that these gospel accounts are different is the fact that only Matthew and Luke include any mention of the Christmas story. I mean, we make a huge deal out of, uh, out of Christmas throughout December. We've kind of lost the idea of Christmas Day. We now have Christmas month throughout, uh, throughout December. But apparently to Mark and John, uh, they didn't really care that much about Christmas, it seems. Now, this, as we see, these differences between these gospel accounts, this is evidence of what we were speaking about earlier when Paul showed that he will present the gospel in different ways to reach all different people. And the fact that we have these four different gospels is evidence of that. So we go through these four different gospel accounts and then we get to the book of Acts. And it's in this moment when we get to the book of Acts, when the gospel stops being proclaimed to just a small group of Jews, predominantly in Galilee, to the gospel now being on the move and and being told in multiple different ways to varying groups of people. It's shared to Jewish elites, Jewish civilians, Romans, Greeks, and anyone who will come and listen. In all of these different times, we see the gospel being shared in different ways, but with some unifying themes. The tone that the gospel is presented in changes throughout all the different times. Sometimes it's blunt and direct. Other times it's gentle and warm. Other times it's building a case or building an argument. The tone changes depending on the audiences. And one of the best examples of this comes in Acts 17 when Paul is sharing the gospel in Athens. One of the things that we see in uh, Acts 17 verse 18 is that Paul has been sharing the good news of Jesus already with this certain group of Athenians. So there is already a pre-existing understanding of Jesus and his death and resurrection. But to be able to contextualize the gospel message to this group in particular, Paul does this masterclass in presenting the gospel. You might like to turn there to Acts 17, verse 22 to 31, or you might just like to listen. 
<coughs> this is Paul's masterclass right here in how to present the gospel to, uh, to this group. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of, uh, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Now, Paul has already done a, a later foundational work for his hearers by telling them about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. But then he goes back to present the rest of the good news message in a way that his hearers are able to connect with, understand, and then respond to. He speaks to their unknown God and uses these four elements, which we'll speak about more in a minute, to outline his gospel presentation. The first thing he uses, speaks of, is God's intention, that we are God's offspring given life and breath, created to inhabit the whole earth. But then he speaks to our failure. In our ignorance, we created gods for ourselves made out of gold, silver, and stone. But then he speaks to God's loving response. The resurrection of Jesus gives proof to the fact that now we can be on the right side of God's justice. And then he presents good news. God calls on all people to repent and to be made right with God. So Paul presents a concise, clear, contextualized version of the gospel to a very unique uh, audience of Athenians that is very different from a Jewish audience. But we see in the following verses that some of these people, some of these Athenians, they became followers of Paul and they believed. This was an, effect, an effective presentation for his hearers to understand the good news of Jesus, which incorporated these four elements. <coughs> God's intention, so God's original intention for his creation, our failure, our rebellion and failure and its consequences, God's loving response, the work of Jesus in resolving our failure and its consequences, and then good news the results of repentance towards God and faith in Jesus and his work. At different points throughout the gospel presentation in Acts, you will see many, not always all, but many of these elements included. And I think this is the most helpful way to encapsulate how to share the gospel with anyone that you come into contact with. Now, I can't take any credit for this uh, outline that you see on the screen. This is completely plagiarized. I have stolen this outright. This is drawn straight from an article from John Sweetman, who's part of our church. <coughs> and he wrote a wonderful article called Expressions of the Gospel. And you can grab some booklets uh, on the welcome desk uh, that have this article included and some helpful ways about how you might be able to share the gospel with different groups of people that you come into contact with and how you might contextualize uh, the gospel. 
It shows some of the different gospel presentations presented throughout the New, uh, throughout the New Testament and speaks to some of the groups of people who might be most receptive of it. Uh, you can see the QR code there on the screen right now. You might like to scan that uh, and then keep that on your phone. Uh, There's a very helpful resource, so thank you, John, uh, for that. <laughs> So what is a helpful way for us to frame the gospel, to think about the gospel, to be able to share the gospel? God's intention, our failure, God's loving response, and then there is good news. I find this a very helpful summary for all of us to memorize and know so that when we get into conversations with people about Jesus, We know those things that we need to share if they were going to understand a holistic view of who Jesus really is. Now, the way that this is presented will be different from person to person. It depends so much on where someone has come from and who they have been. So there's some helpful questions you might like to ask when it comes to looking at sharing the gospel. So the first question is, what does this person already know? Do they have an awareness of God? Do they know what sin means? What tone would be most helpful? Do they need me to be warm and caring? Or does this person need me to be uh, confronting right in this moment? What is their attitude towards God? Do they believe in a God? Are they spiritual? Are they an atheist? What good news do they need to hear? Do they need to know that there is a Father who loves them? Do they need to know that there is an eternal life that we can share in? These are the kinds of questions that we need to ask. Australia is a very different place than it was even just 70 years ago. It is becoming more and more diverse, and while I actually think that's a really good thing for us, it does mean that we need to work harder as followers of Jesus on some things. People come to Jesus with completely different pre-existing worldviews based on their ethnicity, their generation, which is a really big one, I think, whether they're rural or urban, socioeconomic background, family expectations. And this means that a cookie-cutter approach to sharing the gospel isn't going to be enough anymore. (coughs) Each of us has to do the hard work to get to know those people who will be sharing the gospel with and then be able to present it in a way that they will be most responsive of based on who they are. And the most important thing as we finish right now, just as the team comes up, is remember that although we have spoken through some, uh, some information here this morning, What we are talking about and what we are sharing is actually good news. This is genuinely good news that we have been given to share with people. This is the greatest news in history that Jesus is now alive. And we should want the world to know this. We were created in the image of God by a good, loving God with good plans and good purposes for us. But we, through our sin, we rebelled and we turned away from God. But Jesus, but Jesus, through his death and resurrection, he has now opened a way for our relationship to be made right with him once again. Now, through faith in Jesus, we can experience the fullness of life that he offers every single one of us. And this is good news that we should want to share with those that we come into contact with. Amen? Oh, that's awful. This is good news, is it not? Amen? Amen. Let's stand together and let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the good news that you have given to us. Thank you for the good announcement that has been proclaimed over centuries and over millenniums now, that has been a life-transforming message for so many people. 
that has meant that so many people around the entire world have come into faith in Jesus. And Lord, we want to see this message go even further. We want people in our local community to know the good news of Jesus. We want people in our families to know the good news of Jesus. We want our friends to know the good news of Jesus. And the reason that we want this is because we know that Jesus really is alive and that you want to give us life here and now to its fullest and you want to give us eternal life great God and so I just ask right now fill us with a passion a renewed passion once again for this good news help us to have clarity in our mind around what the good news really is but then help us to communicate it with the people that we come into contact with in a way that will be helpful and impactful But help us, God, also to not do this on our own strength, but dependent on your Holy Spirit to be at work in every single one of us. We need you, Holy Spirit, right now to come and fill every single one of us so that we might be able to share this in a way that sees many people's eternities and lives impacted for the kingdom. So right now, God, as we sing, as we sing of the good news of Jesus, As we reflect on this amazing announcement that has been proclaimed over years and years, would you help us to remember that this is not just good news for other people, but this is good news for us right now and is able to transform us right now. now. It's not just news that was able to transform us when we first came into relationship with you, but this is news that you want to speak into our hearts afresh right now. Help us to not become apathetic. Help us to not become carefree of the good news that you have given to us. In Jesus' name, amen.